to think about really hard problems <laughs> and not whatever you're working on today, what you could then be working on one decade, two decades, even four decades from now. Because you're the generation who's going to solve all of our problems that my generation doesn't think it's solving. And we need you. So I'm talking about the search for Earth 2.0. And first, I'm going to give you an update on exoplanets. Now, this is what I'm going to tell you about, that we know of thousands of planets orbiting stars other than the sun. And we actually have reason to believe that every star in our Milky Way galaxy has a planetary system. So the next time you go to a night sky and can see stars, even just out tonight, you'll be able to see at least two or three. <laughs> and, uh, you, know, you can now wonder what kind of planets are around those stars. And when I go out, I wonder what kind of planets are there, and maybe if there's any intelligent life there, looking back at our sun, our star, and wondering what's, what's around us. So that's what I'm going to talk about. And what I'm going to start with, actually, is a movie. It's a little animation taken from this software called Eyes on Exoplanets. And this is something that each one of you, I actually urge you to download it and use it and show it to all your friends and just try it out. It's amazing. Now here, it shows you what we think our Milky Way galaxy looks like if we could view it from above. This part is just illustration made up. But what the software quickly, quickly gets to is a real map of the sky, a real map of stars. And each of these highlighted objects is actually a star with a known exoplanet. So can you see the little white dots? It'd be hard to see from that at the back, but there's some that are really bright, they're yellow, red, or blue, depending on the type of star. But each of the highlighted ones, you can actually click on it and see what kind of planet is there. Now what's really nice about the software as it zooms into Earth is it includes spacecraft, including heliocentric spacecraft, spacecraft that are orbiting our sun, they're in an Earth trailing orbit including um, Kepler and Spitzer space telescopes. It also shows epoxy. It also shows the Voyagers. Now it zooms into Earth, and you can go anywhere on the planet. Here, it's the west coast of North America. And looking up at the spring night sky, here's what you would see. Well, not quite, because the constellations are overlaid. And the stars shown here are, you would, need, you would need binoculars or a telescope to see them. But you can literally go anywhere on the Earth, as long as it's actually night at that time, because the software does operate in real time. And that would be like what you would see in the sky. And it even gives you an option to just see the ones that you could see with your naked eye in a dark site. So then it gives you the feeling of just how many planets are out there. Now in this case of this software, it shows us a very special patch of the sky. Does anyone know what this patch of the sky is with so many stars or planets? The Kepler Space Telescope looked at that one part of the sky for four years, and it found thousands of planets. The software also lets you dial in if you happen to know the name of a planet, this one is for Kepler-186, so it'll actually take you to where that star is in this real map of the sky. And look, this one actually has five planets. We know of systems with multiple planets. And in this particular case, there's a little menu on the left, which actually, if I had, if it wasn't a movie, there's one that is really cute. How long to travel here? <laughs> and when you press this one, this one is the part that's good for kids because you can go automobile, train, speed of light, but no matter what you type it, you know, no matter which button you press, it takes a very long time. <laughs> uh, but here, what's useful is you can overplot this habitable zone, the distance from the star, where if heated by the star, a planet with a thin atmosphere would be not too hot, not too cold, but just right for life. And so um, if you play with this software, you can quickly get a sense of how many planets and how many zones there are. Now here, there's the fine print. It's so small on purpose so you can't read it. Hypothetical visualization of planet. Because <laughs> right now we have no images of planets like that other than the ones in our own solar system. I don't think, like, I don't want to give any negatives because you'll see later in my talk how ambitious our plans are. I don't think we'll be able to spatially resolve planets like that in other planetary systems anytime soon. So to summarize, there are so many stars with planets out there. Every, anywhere you go on Earth and look up in the sky, there are stars with known planets, and probably all of those stars have planets around them. And now I just want to give you a bit of a more of like an engineering and science summary, because that software admittedly is mostly for people who don't um, understand graphs. <laughs> but here, I want you to look on the right, <laughs> just look at the right panel, and what it's showing you are all the planets that are known in terms of the planet size and in terms of the orbital period. This is a log-log plot, so it spans a tremendous, huge space. Earth is listed here at one Earth size. Jupiter is up here at 10 times the size of Earth. Neptune is four times the size of Earth. This is orbital period in days, so it's the year of the planet. And Earth would be here. 
Okay, we don't have any that are kind of Earth size and Earth's orbit yet. Um, the dark part of the diagram, it's dark because we can't reach there yet. But look at this. How many planets are here? We, I've already mentioned there are thousands of them. But it's just unbelievable to me that the planets cover what we call all parameter space. Any size, any orbit you can think of, actually there's a planet like that, as long as it's within the laws of physics and chemistry. I mean, there are planets that are so close to the star. This is orbital period in days. This is one day right here. Look at that. There's so many planets who have their year, their orbit is less than one day. And they're so close to the star by Kepler's law, the shorter the period, you know, the closer to the star the planet is. Some of those planets are heated to like thousands of degrees Kelvin, hot enough to melt rock. So there's a lot of different diversity out there, but what I want to draw your attention to for now, um, and anyway, this is an observation. We don't really understand why planets are everywhere possible. We think that that the game um, of planet formation, that it's like a very stochastic process, it's random. Something forms and grows at the expense of other things. We think it's like a giant game of billiard balls where things are um, interacting with each other and planets are interacting with the gas disk. But I want you to draw your attention to the plot. And can you see where there's the most highest density of points? See where the yellow looks black? There's so many planets here. And what nature is telling us that at least so far in all the types of planets we can see, the most common type of planet is in here. The most common type of planet we know about so far is a planet of two to three times the size of Earth, which, you know what? It has no solar system counterpart. So if there's one thing that you can take away here that's about science, you can take away this point that actually the most common type of planet out there that we know about, uh, we don't know how it formed or why it's there, and we have nothing like it in our own solar system. So that's partly why we need more space missions to learn more about planets. I do have a histogram about it, but I'm gonna skip that because I wanna make sure I spend time on the space missions. So before I get there though, I just have a few uh, fun things to show you. These are NASA travel posters, and they're retro, even going before my time, about you know travel destination posters that people had for, like, for Earth. But these ones are hopefully to inspire you, because when we find another Earth, we're hoping that you can figure out a way to send something there, whether it's a probe or even our you know, DNA and raw biological materials. We hope this will be in your mind for the far future. Kepler 186F, where the grass is always redder on the other side. <laughs> Kepler 186F is the planet I showed you in the animation, and it orbits a red star. So it's just some thought that the vegetation color on another world may be different than on our Earth. He experienced the gravity of HD 40307G, a super Earth. This particular rocky planet it's about, has a surface gravity of about one and a half times that of Earth. Remember we saw that planets had all sizes and orbits. We know the mass of a bunch of the planets also. We can get their surface gravity. Relax on Kepler 16b, the land of two suns, where your shadow always has company. <laughs> um, and you know, I really can't overemphasize that exoplanets have every possibility. There are planets, there are two stars, imagine, that are orbiting each other. There are planets that orbit those two stars. We know about a dozen of them, and there's probably way more out there. So we like to say that science fiction got some things right. And I just want to know how many of you already have tickets for Star Wars coming out in summer. I also already have tickets. Um, okay, so for most of the planets, we don't really know much about them, actually. This artist's conception is a bit extravagant still, because it shows this nebulosity in the sky. But this will probably be the best picture to show you, that we know about stars, we know about how big they are and what color they are, we know about the size of the planet, but here it's dark, we don't know much about it. And that's the whole goal of exoplanets, to learn um, more details about the planets, and not just know how many are there in their orbits. And what we'd really like to do in the search for Earth 2.0 is find a planet in the habitable zone of its star. So that is, for those of you who haven't heard the concept, we have a cartoon here of a star, a planet close to the star, think of like Venus or Mercury, too hot. It's so close to the star, it's heated by the star. Too hot for liquid water, which we think we need for life. It's too hot for complex molecules that would form life. Out here, too cold. You know, Mars actually has a thin atmosphere. People want to terraform Mars. We think if it had a thicker atmosphere, it would be warm. But for what it's worth, even a planet further away than Mars, no matter how big it is, if it has um, carbon dioxide, that would freeze out eventually. Water vapor would freeze out. And once those greenhouse gases freeze out, the planet is cold. And here, it's just showing you Earth in the green zone and the planet like Earth, just right. <coughs> what I wanted to say that I won't talk about, but you know what? All those planets are so different. 
that they could be, um, really this habitable zone depends on the type of planet and type of star. And more specifically, it depends on the type of atmosphere because of the greenhouse power of an atmosphere. On our own Earth, you know, we're worried about adding parts per million of carbon dioxide. Imagine if we had a planet that had 10 times more carbon dioxide or 100 times more. In particular, you know what, to all those, remember when I showed you the plot at the beginning with all those planets? Did you know that Venus and Earth would appear very, very similar to another intelligent civilization that has a Kepler space telescope? Because they'll see the planet has the same size as Earth. If they can measure the mass, then it'll be about the same mass as Earth. It's true it has a different orbit, but as regards to the habitable zone, they might put Venus and Earth both in their, in their so-called understanding of the habitable zone. So in order to make any progress at all, we need to get spectra. And in this picture, I'm showing you um, the solar spectrum, which is the spectrum of our sun, but it's that same concept, divide the light up into colors and look for missing lines that are due to absorption by gases. So actually, that's where the whole field of exoplanets needs to go to find Earth 2.0, is to be able to look at atmospheres and to look for gases in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide, um, water vapor, and even gases that might be produced by life, such as oxygen, methane, and we have a whole list of them. So science fiction got some things wrong. And this actually is, um, this is actually Star Trek Enterprise. It's very kind of old fashioned for, for you probably. But think of all the science fiction that you know, books or movies, they all involve traveling to another planet. And I feel like science fiction got some things wrong because in Star Trek, the Enterprise would have to travel great distances and incredible speeds to actually go in orbit around another planet. So that Spock here could actually look up to the planet and see if it was habitable and if there were life forms. And so I always wonder, like the people who made the show, did they realize that um, we actually would have another way to study planets far away? Because we do. This is the real, a real photograph of the Hubble Space Telescope. I kind of think they might have figured that out, but it would be just too boring to have a show about astronomers working on their computers downloading data from Hubble <laughs> trying to figure out what's going on because that's what we do, and it's not enough for a show, but I wanted you to know that we do have atmosphere measurements of planets, but not of Earth 2.0, so that's still in the future. Right now, this is just, I'm gonna give you a two slide, very brief kind of taste of, of exoplanet atmospheres. What we, what we do is we work with transiting planets that go in front of the star. And some of the planets, um, this is a cartoon, it's very exaggerated, but see this little blue part? It represents the planet atmosphere. And some of that starlight shines through the atmosphere. And just like shining a flashlight through a fog, some of the light won't make it through. And if you can actually look at that at wavelength by wavelength, you can actually end up reconstructing um, a spectrum like that colored one I showed you. So the planet goes in front of the star, the starlight shines through the atmosphere, and we actually can pick up some features in the planet atmosphere. And that's kind of something, if it resonates, you're interested, you can look at more up it on your own but it's an incredible field that I was very pleased to help start actually, this whole thing about planet atmospheres. And now we have data, and although I don't have time to explain the data in detail, I just wanted you to know we have real data. The black points are data. This is wavelength in microns, so here we're going from 0.2 to 1.6 microns. I'm not gonna explain this, but this is, these are points that if we had no spectrum, if there was no difference in the, um, if, there was, if there were no features in the spectrum, this would be a straight line. We would just see that at all wavelengths, all light makes it through the atmosphere. But because there's some absorption at specific wavelengths, we actually can identify that there are some gases in this atmosphere. At least you can agree with me that this is different from a straight line. Okay? And in exoplanets, if our data is good enough to actually see a feature by eye from the back of the room, like that's good news for us. Because we went for years with no data, and with data that people would be sort of looking sideways and not, not sure if it was really anything. So that was kind of my update, um, my tour de force on exoplanets. There are thousands of them. We have some atmosphere measurements for maybe a few dozen. And now I'm gonna to turn to talk about two space missions. Um, but I don't have time really to put it into context, but there are tons of space telescopes working on exoplanets. I just want you to know that some of them, like Hubble, only works for giant planets, big planets with hot atmospheres. We won't be able to actually um, use Hubble to study any kind of Earth 2.0. We have some stuff coming up that I'll talk about briefly. The TESS Space Telescope and James Webb Space Telescope. Those will work with small stars. Think like Earth's, Earth's cousin, a small planet orbiting a small red dwarf star. Now for the future, I'll, our first chance of finding Earths and suns, that's what I'll talk about um, after I talk about TESS. So the TESS Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. Have, has anyone here heard of this? 
I know that there are people from MIT, so hopefully the ones who, some of the ones who have heard of it. What TESS is, it's an MIT-led NASA mission to launch in 2017. It's considered a pretty cheap mission, and it costs $200 million. <laughs> and that's partly because of the high risk, um, low tolerance for risk. Believe it or not, on TESS, there's no new technology. The only deployable are the solar panels. You can see here, the hinges don't hold up. And what it is, it consists of four very specialized cameras. Think of a glorified telephoto lens. But they're very custom made, they're athermal. They have no vignetting or weird things going on in the actual image. And there's four of them, and they're only about this big. They're about um, 10 centimeters in diameter. And Tessa's goal is to look at the entire sky over two years, looking for transiting planets. So we're gonna be looking at the stars, um, taking data every few seconds that gets binned on board, and each field of the sky will be viewed for about a month with overlap at the poles. And this data will come down to Earth, and then it will come to MIT, where we will be actually looking for little tiny drops in brightness that signify a planet going in front of the star. So for those who are familiar with Kepler, it's like a, another version of Kepler. Only its difference is it won't be as precise as Kepler. Kepler could reach parts per million, uh, 30 parts per million over, let's say, six hours for one of their types of star. Tess won't do as well, but it's looking around small stars, looking for small planets. And I wanted to show you an actual mock-up, a model, of the test spacecraft. Like, that's how big it is. That's myself. This is our PI, George Ricker, and here's another physics professor, Josh Wynn, and here's our deputy PI, Roland Vanderspeck. What you can see here is inside here is where the four cameras are. That's this here. Um, this is the part of the spacecraft. The solar panels are, are here. You can't see them. It's folded up. And this is our KA band antenna. And in the spacecraft bus here, that's where everything else would be, the batteries, storage, um, etc. Here's one of the cameras. We put the camera with the smallest person <laughs> so it looks as, on the team, so it looks as big as possible. <laughs> and it looks so big because it has this giant baffle. This was one, this baffle here, um, actually this was 3D printed, not for the real one going in space, but just to, this was our prototype. We had to build two prototype cameras to do thermal tests and vibration tests, just to have our mission compete well enough to be selected to go forward by NASA at the end of our so-called phase A. So that's what the camera looks like right now. We have one, our engineering flight model is being tested in the lab. It's being vibrated, it's being um, testing it with light to make sure that we got what we, had, what we were expecting in terms of the camera performance. Um, students are working in the lab testing out the detector from the flight batch of detectors. I can tell you a lot about tests, but it's going to um, look at the whole sky. Its cameras are aligned in a way that they cover a 90 degree by 24 degree strip of the sky. So for each month, it will actually be looking at one strip of the sky and then tile around the whole sky. And if you're interested in seeing a novel orbit for space telescopes, Google later on, just YouTube test exoplanet and you'll come to an eight minute video that shows you an incredible orbit. And one thing you should know is that first, unlike for communications and other things, you know, Leo, Geo, they're terrible for exoplanets and for any astronomy. Because Earth is actually bright, it's bright and reflective light, it's actually hot. And it just causes a lot of problems. And you know, Hubble orbits in a um, day-night orbit of 90 minutes. It's bad for astronomy, because stuff heats up even a tiny bit and expands, and then contracts again. And not always contracting exactly perfectly to how it was before. And we use Hubble, but it's not nice. So we want to be far from Earth and have continuous dark sky and just get away from the thermal and reflected light problems from Earth. And so TESS is in a highly elliptical orbit stabilized with the moon. And it's going to go out um, for 13.6 days. And when it comes back in three, it asks you a five hour window to zip around and download its data. And it'll just keep going like that for many years. So I talked a lot about tests. It's going to happen. It's scheduled for launch in summer to fall of 2017. But um, you know, transits are limited to planets with a fortuitous alignment. Transits have to be lined up just so. Um, for those who, who have been following exoplanets, we've had a boon from transits. They're very easy to study, but they're just limited because we think that planets and their orbits go in all directions. And so now I'm going to get, I really hope you're going to pay attention to the next part of the talk because I know most of you are engineering students and work in engineering. And like most other audience I talk to, you'll understand just how hard this problem is. So what we really need to do is go to space above the blurring effects of Earth's atmosphere. And we need a way to block out starlight so we can see the planet directly. We'd like to be able to see planets around um, any star in the sky, at least all of the bright, close sun-like stars. So we'd like to do what we call direct imaging, suppress the starlight to find planets. But the problem is that when we're looking, thinking of Earth 2.0, our Earth 
is 10 billion times fainter than our sun in reflected light. So we need to be able to suppress the starlight, to literally block it out to one part in 10 billion so that none of that light gets to our detector so we can actually see the planet directly. And I know what your answer is going to be if I say, well, have any of you worked on a problem where you have to build something that can make a measurement to 10 decimal places? Actually, you know, no audience says, unless it's someone who works on gravity probe B or something about Einstein, proving the science <laughs> theory of gravity. So this is a really hard problem. And we imagine actually putting a giant screen in space that would formation fly with a telescope, it would block out the starlight so we can see the planet directly. But the problem with putting up a circular screen in space is diffracted light. If we put up a big circular screen and try to block out a point source of light, our telescope would record an image of an airy ring pattern. It's hard to see from the back, but you know what an airy ring pattern is. You block out a point of light, but because the light diffracts around the edges, you get rings of light. And that first airy ring is 100,000 times brighter than the planet you're looking for. So that's not good. And just for those, in case there's anyone in the audience who forgot what the airy rings were, this whole diffraction thing, it's not really accurate, but it's somewhat analogous to dropping a pebble in a pond where it makes ripples because light can act like a wave and make ripples, just like dropping that pebble is. What we want to do is put a very special shape in space, shaped like this. And the analogy here would be, would be like dropping a pebble in a pond, and all the water all around the pond is perfectly smooth to one part in 10 billion. And all the ripples are on the outside. It's like the waves have been pushed to the outside. And that's because diffracting light um, is not a simple thing. People worked on this since the 1960s, when they had math and complicated mathematical functions what's the best shape, and recently people actually worked harder on it. So we'd like to put this special shape in space. You can also put a special shape inside the telescope, internal coronagraph, but I'm not gonna be talking about it today. Here's an animation showing you a concept where you could launch a star shape and telescope together, and the petals of that specially shaped screen would unfurl. And a second stage of deployment with the truss expanding, the petals would snap into place. Now that's a nice image, but this star shape has to be made to very, very tight tolerances. The petals have to be made to within, let's say, tens to about 100 microns. They have to deploy with respect to each other to sub-millimeter. And the hard part here is that the whole thing has to formation fly tens of thousands of kilometers from the telescope. It has to line up just precisely enough. You know, you might ask, why don't you put like a star shape, a smaller one really close to the telescope? It's just the mathematics of diffraction don't let that work out. So that's called the star shape, and that's pretty much my favorite concept right now. And I want to show you a couple more things about the star shape before wrapping up. I've got to learn some reality to this concept. So here's a technology deployment demo from about two years ago. Now here you see some of the petals unfurling from their stowed position. And this is taken um, in real time. If you look closely, you'll see those longerons snap into place to rigidize the pedal. There you go. And this, what's so amazing about this to me is that this inner truss here, it wasn't built for the star shape. It's left over from large radio deployables. So we have heritage. This is the second stage of deployment where that inner truss is expanding and the petals will snap into place. I always get asked where are the people here because we're not going to have astronauts in space where the star shape is going to be far from Earth's gravity. But in this case, the point was to demonstrate that the petals could be deployed to the same position relative to each other, um, two millimeters. The star shape, that star shape is being built out at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I actually was just there earlier this week and see that they have made tremendous progress. This actually, here's myself and two of my team members with one of the petals um, in the lab it kind of looks dangerous. See this tip here? <laughs> it is. <laughs> and we actually just finished a two-year study of the star shade. It was sponsored by NASA who asked us, this is a good question to be asked, but well, what can you do for a billion dollars? <laughs> and actually, it's not really that much if you have a lot of technology development still to go. And you saw the star shade needs to have two spacecraft, one for the star shade, one for the telescope. But that's what we worked on. And if you have any interest, you can look up um, star shade, JPL, if you add my name into it, you'll come across a report we made. I don't necessarily encourage you to read all 200 pages, but it's got a four-page executive summary, and you can get, get the details there. So to wrap up, I want to give you a vision of what we will see with the star shape, um, when the star shape does finally get funded and launches. And this is actually an image, a simulated image, of what our planetary system would look like 
at about, uh, let's say about 20 light years away. And what you see here is Jupiter pops out very brightly. You also can see Saturn. You see a dust ring that's actually brighter, it's an enhanced, closer version of our Kuiper belt. And in the middle, you see where the star shape would block out the starlight to one part in 10 billion. And at the edges here, unfortunately, what we're really worried about is zodiacal dust. Our asteroid belt, you know, the asteroids collide together once in a while, and they generate dust, which is very bright and very reflective. Nonetheless, superimposed on the dust ring, this is a real simulated image, you actually can see two blobs here, which on further inspection with more data, one turns out to be Earth and one is Venus. And here's a background galaxy. So in the end, what we're looking for is Earth 2.0, we want to see a pale blue dot, just like this real photograph, real image of Earth taken by the Voyager 1 spacecraft at 4 billion miles away. And in here, although this red light is light scattered in the Voyager camera optics, that actually does represent our, our exozodical dust. And from this pale blue dot, we will break the light up into colors, and we'll look at the line, the spectrum. We'll try to see the lines that are missing there, and that's the whole goal, and that's the first step towards finding another Earth. So to summarize, thousands of exoplanets are known. I encourage you to download the software from NASA, Eyes on Exoplanets, and explore for yourself. Small planets are very common. We saw that planets two to three times the size of Earth are the most common planets we know of so far, and evidence starts to show us that smaller, rocky planets are even more common. We have about 20 planets in the so-called habitable zone, but I emphasize we don't know if any of those planets are habitable yet until we can study the atmospheres and see the greenhouse power of the atmosphere. Um, the next generation of telescopes, there's many different versions on the ground and in space, and they each have a chance of finding or identifying a habitable world. I told you about the test space telescope, and that will is scheduled for launch in 2017. And I finished off telling you about the starshade, which is our first chance to find the pale blue dot. Thanks for your attention.